in a second, we'll go for a pub crawl and we'll uh, see how what the Vilnius has to offer to us. Um, so I'll try to make this presentation um, entertaining. So we have a good kind of um, first um, kind of beer of um, knowledge before we go um, out. So let's get started. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for voting, and I want to use um, this opportunity to be here on this stage and talking with you um, to just um, share our support with all um, the community in, in Ukraine and with, um, especially with the Ruby community in Ukraine. Um, I think it's uh, very important to, to keep that support coming. Um, and kind of going back to the topic, um, I will talk about the multi-tenant, uh, of splitting your multi-tenant multi application. And it's actually a story of a business success. So the problem that we're going to solve today comes with um, how your application grows and how it's actually successful. So let's start with an example. And let's imagine an entrepreneur. I think there are many. There are some of entrepreneurs on this very, uh, in the audience. Um, and let's imagine that person has an idea for a SaaS application. And for the sake of the example, it envisions that there are shops that would like to sell through their platform um, to their clients, and they can set up their shops and kind of operate um, those um, shops through their platform. Kind of might sound um, similar. Um, kind of, yeah. So th this is the idea, the, the business idea. And then the entrepreneur has to take that idea and bring it to the public and create that application. It starts with a seed, so the idea is first in the head and then the idea goes into the computer. In the Ruby community, we have fantastic tools to bring up a new applications that bring business value to the clients very quickly. Depending on what you use, you can use Rails, um, you can use Sinatra, Hanami, wherever it works, but it's just amazing because it's Ruby, right? I was like, this is my first ever echo conference, yeah. I was expecting this, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Cool, so um, our entrepreneur set up the application and there are actually people who want to use the, the system and there's a shop that comes to the platform and the shops brings their first users. So there are actually people who buy products through our platform. Entrepreneur had um, a good idea and there are more shops coming up to the platform, so it grows. But this growth is happening organically because we started with just a seed, remember about that. So then the market expands and actually there is not enough clients in the original market in which we started. So you need to expand globally. You need to bring clients from another countries. But the thing is, again, we are growing organically so our data is still in the original place where application was stored. But then a client comes in, a very pros um, prospectus client comes in and says, I want to use your platform, but I don't want you to store my data in another region. I want it to have it where I'm based. So instead of having the data in the original place, I want to have it where I'm from, in the region where I'm operating from. There are data compliance things. This is something important to us. And this is a real case example of what can happen. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you move from having data in a single region to a multi-region setup? And it's based on the real example. I work in a company called Apply4. It's a SaaS platform um, that allows film industry and event industry to get permits for what they do. And we faced exactly the problem that I'm describing here. Our clients are not shops, are authorities that give permits um, to users across um, uh, USA, um, England, Canada, and New Zealand. Uh, and this is a B2G, um, B2G platform, so these are our clients, and then the shops in the previous example, and then the users are actual event and film um, producers who want to have their um, events organized. And this is example that I showed is based on what we face. But instead, in our case, from shops, we have authorities. And that's the only difference, conceptually, between the two. And the request was 
real. We, can, we had clients from US saying, we don't want your data to be stored in the UK where our platform started. We, want, we have to have our data stored in the US in order to continue uh, using your platform. And that takes us on the journey of the multi-region. So what's the actual goal of this, um, of this move? We start with the setup where all the data is stored in the original place where we start our application. And we want to end up in a situation where the client's data is stored exactly in the country where they are from. And we are talking here about a multi-tenant, multi-region setup. Multi-tenant because we serve from one application, from one Rails application, we serve many clients. This is the bottom side. But then they're multi-region because those clients are based in different places on our planet Earth. So this is, when I say multi-region, multi-tenant, that's exactly what I'm referring to. I want to point out to one more thing. So as you can see, there are some colors used here, the yellow one and the violet one. So these are actually quite important because throughout the presentation, you'll see that if something is of that color, it belongs to that region, to that country. So you can spot where it is. Um, cool. So just to kind of give you a bit, a small context of what I actually mean by data. So I say data is stored. In our case, these are um, databases, so files that we, um, yeah, the database records that we have. And then there are files, files that users uploaded when they, use, when they were using our application. In terms of the stack, it's a kind of quite simple. Don't worry, I don't want to get into details of the infrastructure. It's just about to give you an, an overview. We have the, the data persistence, persistence layer with database Redis um, and files storage. We have the application, which is actually serves the web server and the Rails app. And we have this top part, which actually allows users to connect to your application and uh, presents your system to the outer world. And so what are your options on the table to actually implement the requirement that was given by the user? And I want to talk about two options. The first one is keeping your one application, so you still have just one um, Rails application, but then you separate the data layer, the data persistent layer, and you sort of conditionally um, root requests for specific tenants, shops, authorities, to the data uh, in the correct region. As you can see, in this setup, the logic of to, where, to which database you need to connect is placed in the application. So that's where you're hiding all the logic. And then the other approach is to completely separate the two applications. So f f instead of having one application, you end up two separate ones. And uh, in that case, you serve kind of two different data. Uh, they don't know about, uh, nothing about each other. They live separate lives. And in order to determine which option is good for you, because it might depend on application case by case, you need to ask yourself a couple of questions. So first of all, can tenants move across the regions? In our case, like, it's quite difficult to move a city authority to another country, like it's not really viable. Um, then, how much data is shared across the region? So is there a data part that is shared? And then, can users operate in different regions? So can they switch from the shop in one region to another and they want to be still the, the same user? In our case, the answers led us to the decision to go with option number two, to completely separate the system and that's where the fun begins. Because we want to, st starting with this one system, end up with two different separate systems. And if you start to think what you need to do in order to get there, the list is quite, quite long. And wh when I was thinking, like, what would take us to actually do it, like, in one go, that was the picture I had in my mind. Uh, any Assassin's Creed fans here? Yeah. Good. So imagine that that one shot that you have, you need to you know, get to this haystack at the bottom, and you, it's like 40 meters down. It's, well, I wouldn't do it for the first time. Like myself, maybe it's controversial, but I know. I'll just take the stairs and go down step by step. And that's the thing that I want to tell you. Do the migration gradually, step by step. You don't have to do it in one go because it's too dangerous, it's too risky. 
And that's what we did. We decided to split the, uh, to, to have the split up in two stages. The first one, redirecting users, and then splitting the data. And the redirecting users, the aim is to not touch the data at the first stage. So we start with one system, with one, let's say, app URL, and we move to a situation where we have two separate containers, two separate URLs, but data has, has not changed. We haven't done anything to the data part. And uh, the important thing is that um, we end up in a situation where um, we can introduce it. Users can start using the app one and app two domains, but actually without no risk. Their data will still be where, where it was. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, as you can see, we don't touch the data persistence layers. It stays as it was, but we create two new applications uh, there. And the business requirement for this stage is to seamlessly direct users from using just one URL to using two separate URLs. We don't want users to spot any difference. So it's about redirecting users to, the, to their correct region. And you can ask here, why up one and up two? You might choose something more specific for the country that you uh, place users, but in our case, it makes sense to keep it a bit more vague. That's why I'm referring to up one and up two throughout the presentation. And for that task, to redirect, um, to redirect requests from that one application to two, there are a couple of tools that we can use. And the tools that are available to us is DNS and load balancers. That's what we're going to use. And in order to understand what's going on, imagine that you want to go um, to a conference. And you arrived, and ah, it's actually, you arrived at the university, and you don't know where the Euroka conference is happening. So you go and ask someone, you speak a bit of Lithuanian, and you say, ask, where's Euruko? And they say, yeah, it's there in that room. And you go there, you see maths, everything's fine. You ended up in the right place. But imagine that you come to the conference, you ask where the conference is, they say, yeah, in that room. You go there, and then you actually see this slide. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's not where I want it to go. So then what you do is you revert and you go back to the actual place where you want it to go. And that's what we're doing when we want to get users to the correct region. So the DNS sort of takes the, uh, takes the request, not per request, but just once, um, to one or, or the other load balancer. So one or the other room. And then, um, and it's used, um, and it's possible thanks to a geolocation feature of the DNS, where you can say if the origin of this request is from this geographical area, the IP standing behind this URL is this. And then in the load balancer, like if you get to the correct place, which means you should be redirected to, to the URL of that region, you stay there. But if for some reason you ended up in the wrong place, and we can identify this by a path, for example, because we have country in a path, fortunately, you can kind of say, okay, you shouldn't be here, you shouldn't be in that room, go to the other one, um, and that's where you should be. And that's more or less how that thing works, and it's quite um, useful to redirect users to the correct region. And one thing here, although 301 redirects seems like a reasonable idea here, it doesn't work completely because of some caching, so we ended up with uh, using 302. It's a tip for you to use. And then, don't forget about um, actually your, about your CEO, and please set the alternate links that will point um, from app one to app two, and vice versa, depending on the country um, for which that page is um, destined for. So please remember about the CEO and building your application. And once we do that, once we redirect users to the correct region, we end up in this quite progress, like we progress quite a lot. We end up in a situation where we have two separate URLs, two separate applications, and data waiting for us to look at it and actually split and put into the correct place. 
And that's what we're going to do now. So, in the stage two, what we want to end up is to take that setup with two applications and move it alongside the data to two separate regions. And as you can see, we actually haven't moved the application to, to another region yet. We split the applications, but we kept everything in the UK. So sort of things were as they were. In this case, we want to move everything to the new setup. And I, when I say everything, that means everything. We create a second copy of all the infrastructure pieces in both regions including the data persistence layer, application, but also importantly, for example, your logging, because you don't want to have your logging to be put in the wrong region. It's a data breach as well. So how do you actually separate the database, which is kind of the biggest question of, of all. So let's imagine a database. I mean, it was a great session before me. Um, very simply, this is database, this is table, this is record just to uh, say that everyone knows what this picture is. Um, and if you try to think how the data is placed, it sort of includes pieces from both regions plus parts that are shared across both regions. And what you want to do is kind of take those and create two databases, but with just select, uh, selected data. The first thing you need to do is to go through your tables in your database and decide, does that table include data that should be either separated, so it includes pieces from both regions, or is that table just meant to be put into both regions? That's the first decision you need to make. And be wary, if you see that the shared table can change quite um, often, Think about two strategies. First of all, sensing between the regions, which might be complicated. Secondly, moving the data into the configuration, so it's stored in the code if it changes um, rapidly. And then, how do you actually take the table and separate it into two uh, different, uh, different tables? It's through the system called bucketing. I have a question here. Um, do you recycle your garbage? Of course you do. You're nice people. <laughs> I, I tried, I tried. Uh, okay, so in terms of um, garbage recycling, the idea from splitting is very similar. You take, like, your garbage data. I'm not saying your data is garbage, it's just garbage. And you put it into the correct bin. And the same applies to the data that you do. So in our case, the buckets are not you know, types of metal. Um, in this case, it's about where the data should be put in, in which region it should be put in. And you take the table, and you sort of go through all of the records and just assign a correct region one by one until you end up with things separated. And this is what you do conceptually. That's how you split it. But we have a concrete code that stands behind it. And the idea here is that the packet is an actual column that you add to all of your tables. So in your uh, database, you just add a column called bucket, let's say, and you add it to all of your tables. And then in your Ruby, Ruby on Rails code, you create um, a code that kind of shows which an enum value that shows in which uh, bucket that record is put into. You then include it in all of your models, and suddenly you have that information about the bucket in which region is placed. And that's how we connect the concept with the real implementation. It wasn't that far. It's actually already, we're already there. But then how do you select the bucket? We know we want to place, but how do you know to which region, to which bucket that record belongs to? And here, you need to know a bit about your domain. You need to know about how uh, your system works and how specifically the tenant, the shop, the authority um, has their association set up. So, and again, we go from con concept, we are talking about authority that belongs to a country, to an actual code, to a model authority that has an attribute country. So we move now to the code. And that code has a lot of associations, not, yeah, it doesn't really matter what they are, uh, but it grows. It's 
big, and you end up with something like a, a tree shape. And that's what we're going to use. And let's kind of ask ourselves, how do you decide that bottom one, to which region does it belong? And there are two strategies to do that, and we tried both of them. The first one is bottom up. So you go from the leaf, you take this leaf at the bottom, and you go like one step above, one step above, until you actually reach the authority, and then you kind of, based on that information, you know to which region that record belongs to. And the other approach is top-down, where you start from the authority, from the root, where you know the country, and you kind of go step by step until you reach the USA. And as you can see, in this uh, situation, we actually mark all the records on our way um, as um, belonging to one of the buckets. And that's our um, suggestion. The top-down uh, approach proved to be a lot more efficient and easier to implement. And if you want to do that, top-down is the way to go. The code is not that particularly great, and you end up with a lot of associations. If you had a lot, a lot, a lot, then you know, the file will go wrong. But the code behind it, is at the, it ends up quite simple. Because with all the associations on the authority level, you just iterate through all of the associations and assign the bucket value to those records. And ta -dam, thanks to that, you end up with a situation where your da database table has bucket column filled in. And the cool thing here is that you can actually preview the results using a very um, a feature of Rails, which is maybe not that popular, and people tend to uh, discourage the use of it, probably sensibly, default scope. So you can actually use the default scope to just select uh, records from the region, and in that way, in your staging, you can simulate a situation where your data will be split, because thanks to that, you will just have access to the data you plan to have um, after all. And then one last tip about the databases. When you split, the fastest way to, to do the split is to uh, take the database, create a copy, but only with the records that you want to put in, in that table, instead of, for example, deleting records, because deleting in, um, in databases takes time. In this case, it proves to be uh, the fastest, and then you just change the name from, of the table and remove the old one, and suddenly you end up with um, a table that you want to have uh, ready to be uh, moved to the new region. And in a couple of things to uh, remember here about constraints and auto-increment to make sure that you don't forget about those aspects of your database. And leave a buffer of some IDs just to make sure that after uh, two months you have this kind of window in which you won't have any ID clashes. For example, 10% of the records you, that you have in your table, thanks to that, the two regions won't have a clash of IDs for some period of time. And the end result of what we have with our database is this uh, situation where the shared data is in both and the region data is only where it's belong, it's, it should be. And then the file split up, it's very similar in the sense that we have that file that belongs to one or the region, um, and the file is associated with the record that, upload, that was uploaded uh, to, and only that record has the information about the region in which it belongs. So kind of only that record tells you to which region that file should be placed. Um, and from the overview perspective, it's very similar to what database, what we want to do with database, just separate the correct data to, to their correct regions. Um, and because we start with a situation where we sort of know this file should be placed in that region, but it's not really clear because the information is in the database. What you can do is to put that information um, in front, kind of add the region-specific uh, piece of data. For example, a folder name or um, a bucket um, name, something like that. Thanks to that, you can easily identify the files uh, thanks to this um, a kind of added element that assigns the file to one of the regions. Um, and for testing purposes, I recommend creating an empty copy of files. It helps you to actually, uh, I know, run, run the tests without, um, 
yeah, without downloading the whole file system. Um, and what you do with files, you kind of have this old structure, you place the new files, switch the kind of mechanism of the default for the new uploaded files, and then with the time passes, you kind of migrate the old files to the new setup. In, or, in order to support that, you need to have this situation where you kind of place, the, if the file was already moved and exists in the new folder, use that folder, otherwise, it means the file wasn't migrated, so fall back to the old path, and then, if it's a new file, it is, uh, then place it in the new um, folder. And at the end, you end up with a situation where your data is, again, nicely separated. And then the big moment comes, and you want to go live, and, you know, for both steps, for region one and region two, First of all, inform your clients. Get them involved because they sometimes uh, tell you about things that you forget yourself. For example, payment gateways. That's a good example that we, um, that we faced. Um, then, find time when the system is kind of in the low um, usage because you want to use kind of, yeah, you don't want to d disrupt uh, users. And because it's mostly like, I know, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., you really want to do, and I cannot recommend it, uh, more, just create a clear list of the procedure that you're going to follow on the go live. And I think it happens to all of the deployments, uh, and assign people who will run a specific commands. So when you wake up and you don't think at 5 a.m., you just go like a robot through a list of procedures, and thanks to that, you uh, improve your chances of success. And then, um, rehearse, 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 rehearse. The more you you do the whole procedure, the whole go live, or just bits of, um, of, the, of, of the move, the more um, sure you will be at the end result. And in order to actually do the change, I, that's the way to do it, use the DNS. Because the DNS is the moment where your changes are exposed to the outer world. So when you have this old application, what you can do is deploy the new infrastructure, but don't put it in the DNS so it's, no one actually sees that. And what you can do is introduce it when you are sure everything works, which gives you a time to test things and verify that everything is fine. And then finally, when you actually move, you can make it uh, deleted and that would, be, that would be it. And when you actually do the change, when you have a go live date, the very important thing that you can add forget about is to just take leave when that date is set up so you're not there. No joking. You take the leave in order to do the migration in style and this is a little picture of me doing the actual go live moment in the beautiful um, islands near, near Stockholm. So yeah, I recommend take leave when you have the go live uh, date. And then you end up with the happy end situation with your data separated and your clients happy and money flowing into your system. I wanted to thank my whole team who helped me um, in the process of creating this presentation and the whole system change. And I want to thank you and um, enjoy the pub crawl and the rest of the Aruka conference. Thank you.